Hey guys, welcome back to We Watch the Movie. I am Mike, and we have a special episode today. We have Guy Busick, the writer of Not Only Ready or Not, not only Scream 5, but also Scream 6. Guy Busick, everybody. Welcome, sir. Hello. Thank you so much. I know we just said this, but thank you again for taking the time to join us. We are we love talking to writers above all else on this show because you guys decide everything about the characters that we know and love. You guys really don't get enough credit as far as we're concerned, and you're the decision makers, at least at the first step. So we really appreciate you, man. It's my pleasure. Happy to be here. Congratulations to you, by the way, because Scream 6 is killing it right now. Yeah, crossed 100 million yesterday, so uh, we're all pretty excited. I'm kind of a whore for this stuff. I'm like, some people are like, hey, I'm, I don't I don't want to, they're doing it too much. I'm like, no, I want Scream 19, Scream 20, <laughs> Scream 21. Yep. I don't care. Um, uh, I'm, I'm the same way. I would love to watch the series continue in, into infinity. We <laughs> haven't got Scream in space yet, you know? <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Yeah, Go space on the moon, something like that. Yeah, it's fun to even bitch about, you know? I was like, do yeah. they have cell phones in space? I don't know. Maybe the intercoms. <laughs> so speaking of the sequels, this one had so many parallels, it felt like, to Scream 2. Just not just the college, but just the whole vibe of it. I don't know if it's like the hipness to it or like what, but it, <laughs> it felt like you were watching today's version of Scream 2. Was that on purpose? You know, a lot of it was accidental, I think, or subconscious. You know, there were certain things that we were actually trying to steer away from. So it didn't feel like we were trying to, you know, do our version of Scream 2, um, even though essentially it is because it's our second Scream together. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we knew the college was a parallel. The, um, this is a spoiler interview right yes, yes spoilers okay yeah so the, the, Spoiler the parent, warning everybody if you yeah. see screen six before you watch this <laughs> yes please uh the, but the, the parent as killer you know was a parallel and then we were actually a little nervous about setting the the finale in a theater um because of scream 2 um and then we uh jamie and i my co-writer james vanderbilt uh we walked the space in montreal and we were like oh no this does feel completely different so we, that made us more comfortable doing it but i think some of th some of the things that have been pointed out to us since the movie came out have were totally unintentional. Um, so again, it might have been our subconscious seeping into the script or into the production and somehow just like you know unconsciously doing a a, a nod here or there. But yeah, it, a lot of it was just kind of like, oh, I didn't even realize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that that sort of answers. And by the way, I just noticed we did not color coordinate our shirts today on purpose, guys. This was <laughs> yeah, an no, accident. I, just noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what just happened. My wife was making fun of me. She was like, "Are you like going skateboarding, lady? Yeah. What, what are you doing?" Like, I don't, it's a very like, '90s vibe there. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, this is how I dress every day, honey. I don't know what you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> that kind of sort of answers my next question. But a lot of people talking about, and I know you can't, you obviously probably can't talk about Scream Seven because it's not even been announced yet. So it's probably off table. So get that, but. That being said, a lot of people are thinking like, okay, so Scream 3 is definitely going to Hollywood, right? And we're going to do, they're going to copy Scream 3. So instead of asking you about that, I'll just say, in my opinion, I thought this this movie was an ode to not only Scream 2, but it, the shrine made it an ode to all the other sequels as well. Kind of like, just do, that's been done now. Like we did the whole shrine and and it touched on almost every sequel in its own way. So it feels like, should there be a Scream 7, whoever does it or however it happens, it feels like they can move on to something else at this point. I mean, that was definitely the intent of the shrine was like, let's, let's pay homage to every single movie. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's really, uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Like we wanted to represent everything, you know, in our mind, like all of those movies happened. We want to acknowledge them all. And uh, you know, uh, Jamie and I, when we wrote the script, we probably only put nine or 10 of those items in the script. And then it was the production uh, that, that came up with all the others and had to recreate them because a lot of the stuff, I mean, almost all of this stuff didn't exist anymore. And they had to go out to fans in some cases. And like, I think the Tatum outfit was uh, something a, a fan had made and they had to rent it from her. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the props people, the production designers, you know, all of, all of those, the whole crew was just so inventive and creative and coming up with all those little nods, all those little Easter eggs. And I unfortunately didn't get to walk the space when it was uh, put together as the shrine. I, it was it was empty as, a, as just the, the abandoned theater when I was there. But it's really fun for me to even just watch the movie now and go, oh, I hadn't even noticed that one before. It was a really cool idea for me that it made it work for me in a way that like sometimes I feel like movies get lost in the doing the Easter egg thing. But that like mm -hmm. kind of put them all in one place and tied it to the story. So it didn't just feel like fan service when they're showing us all this cool stuff. So I thought that was Good. a really neat idea. Thanks. Yeah. No, it turned out really, really cool. With that one being in New York. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did a video on this and like there was a bunch of crazy, there's so, so many fun ideas like, okay, 
where should Scream go next if we go to a different location? And there was like speed to cruise control, like, <laughs> uh, you know, like let's put let's put Ghostface on a boat, uh, Ghostface <laughs> yep. in the snow. My personal favorite is Ghostface Christmas movie because you've got the snow, you've got the lights, you've got the Black Christmas meta tie-ins, you've got you can even throw him in a white robe and have him be like camouflaged if you wanted to. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think way too much about this. It's honestly sad. But that being said, do you think like where this one went to New York mm-hmm. for the franchise as a whole, if they keep doing that though, like if they keep going to different locales or whatever, do you think it would become too Carmen San Diego ish? Like it should scale back <laughs> a little bit or. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I can't really talk about, you know, the future oh. of, of the franchise, obviously, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I uh, certainly. I have ideas about what, you know, uh, would be a cool setting for future screen movies. But uh, yeah, I think like any other fan. Right on. Yeah, no, and I totally understand that. <laughs> it's, it's one of those <laughs> things you're in a box. Like, I can't even speak on it, much less around <laughs> it. I don't even own a gun, let alone many guns that would necessitate an entire rack. Yeah, they'll send uh, they'll send a, a person in a ghost face mask to kill me if I if I <laughs> speak out of line. So I'm gonna protect my life here. Speaking of that, uh, Roger Jackson, it's it's got to be fun oh. as hell, just writing lines, knowing they're gonna be said in that voice, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, he's just such a pro, and he just elevates everything that we write when he does that voice. Um, and and one time, I think during five, he. Uh, recorded a, a little hello Jamie hello guy <laughs> and I still have that on my phone it was just such a <laughs> such a cool little thing we got him to do one for our podcast so literally our podcast oh. opens up with like uh you know Mike and Jay you know this whole oh, thing okay. it's really cool every, every time we hear you know new takes of him doing that dialogue that we wrote it's just it sends chills down our spine I bet no, and and watching it, I love watching the new movies and seeing how excited he's going to be from one line to the next. Because some of it, he'll just like do it in a cool voice, and then he'll get yeah. excited, like in the opening when he's like, "You're on fire!" I was like, "Oh yeah. my god, that's awesome!" I love yeah. it. I read once that there's like two different kinds of writings, right? Like you either write and you know where you're headed, like you know mm-hmm. the ending as you're writing, or there's the George R. R. Martin thing from Game of Thrones where mm-hmm. you just kind of make it up as you go along. With these two movies, how have you guys done that? Did you guys know where you were headed to or? Yeah, I think uh, in our case, the way the business works, at least on these projects, is we have to pitch out the whole story to Spyglass uh, and Paramount before we start writing. So we, you know, so Jamie and I will just be in a room for a few weeks, you know, or on a Zoom or whatever. um, And we'll figure out the story and we start, you know, with the broad strokes and then we get, you know, hone in on the details. And then finally we have the basic scene structure and we know the killer we know the motive, we know the ending. And then we go in and, and we pitch spyglass and, um, and then we get off to, to writing. And so, and generally there's some form of outline at that point um, that we can kind of work from. And then we, you know, toss that into final draft and then we split up the scenes. And so he'll take, you know, these three scenes and I'll take those and then we'll swap and we'll do a pass on each other's scenes. And eventually it, it kind of like, forms into a, a, a cohesive whole that feels like it was written by, you know, a single person uh, instead of two, you know, different people. And then uh, then it's done. We send it into, you know, that's when the radio silence would get involved and um, Paramount and everybody else and uh, cast. And then we're off to the races. But yeah, we have to have a really, I mean, especially with a murder mystery, like we have to be able to, we kind of work backwards. It's like, who who done it? and why, and then how do we set up all of the um, misdirects and red herrings along the way? And make, we have to make sure the whole thing makes sense. You know, could this person have actually been at this location at this time? Who was the ghost face mm-hmm. in this scene? You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it's, it's really tricky, you know, uh, murder mysteries are, are notoriously hard, um, but when, you know, hopefully we, we pulled it off and, uh, you know, kept you guessing. Yeah, no, I absolutely loved it for one. I don't know if I said that. I'm I'm a huge oh, fan of what you guys are. and ra- and um I was called the movie Radio Silence because it starts with a ready or not <laughs> as well. Like the whole thing. I, I love what you guys are doing. I uh, I've enjoyed it all very much as a screen fan as just as a movie oh, fan. Um awesome. 
with that being said, that reveal, like the way the reveals go, that's so much pressure. Like I could not mm -hmm. imagine the pressure because like most people, if you're writing a surprise whodunit or like uh, just a, a original on its own property, not tied to an IP, that's one thing. But you guys are trying to shock an audience that knows you're trying to shock them. So you're like early career after six cents M. Night Shyamalan. And you know how <laughs> that goes sometimes, you know. Um, but does that do, does that pressure ever get to you? Just knowing that, like, not only do we have to write a movie that ties into all of these, like, you've got your scream standards, but we also have to surprise everybody at the end of it. Oh yeah, I mean, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to to you know make it satisfying. And if it feels like a cheat, or if it feels like a letdown, or in any way anticlimactic, then we haven't done our job. And what's great is that you know we we're not the only ones working on that. Uh, a lot of that can be tweaked in post-production in the edit and if we need to you know really point the finger at a certain character to throw you off 30 minutes in or 50 minutes in or whatever it is we can do that we can find that shot uh mm -hmm. because matt and tyler are so diligent about getting great coverage you know of all the actors and so it's like we we have so many great takes to to choose from so if you're watching a, a version of the movie you know a certain cut and you're like well it would be really great to sort of suspect so-and-so here, um, then they could go back and, and do that. Um, but yeah, we all put pressure on ourselves because we don't we don't want it to just be a big wah wah at the end and you're like, oh, oh <laughs> cool, it's yeah. it's character X. Uh, why the hell would they have done this? So it's, it's tricky. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we work really hard at it. Well, I personally, I've, I've enjoyed both reveals. I know there's always, there's, that's, I think it's one of those things you got to remember, no matter what you do, when it's going to be a shock like that, there's going to be the people like, I knew it all along, this yeah. is bullshit. <laughs> or like, you know, like there's just, that's just, you know, personality or how you expect going into it. I know sure. that with this one, they had, you know, some guy somewhere, I, there was leading up the whole time, and I'm always fighting with people about this, like whether it's anonymous Twitter people or like whatever, people trying to like give out tiny details and and mm -hmm. ultimately the ending leaked um, online, like just a clip of it. I don't know if you already know this or not, but where they showed, I think it was like the first two and it showed, mm -hmm. I didn't see it. I, I stayed mm -hmm. away from it and I actually read who the killer was going to be, but like literally forced myself to forget it. I don't know nice. how I did it, but I did. <laughs> um, Some kind but, of mind trick. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, so I guess this is a two part question. A, how many scripts do you think over the course of scream five and scream six that are different? Do you think are in your desk or on your computer or wherever? You know, that was uh, on five. We did a whole dummy draft uh, where we changed some of the deaths and we had a whole fake third act. And that was the one we gave to actors um, until we shot those scenes. Um, and I, you know, I think we, yeah, I, we, we called it um, the alpha draft uh, and it was just completely, you know, we just made it up. And it was like, I, I, as I said to, at the time we were writing, I was like, I, I've never been so excited to write something that I know for sure isn't going to get shot. <laughs> <laughs> basically doing free work um but it was cool it was sort of like you know we felt like we were um in on some big secret and it was just kind of a fun little project on six we didn't do that we just didn't share the third act with anybody um so we didn't okay. have a whole fake script um but yeah there were at least two drafts two different versions of five that were floating around out there um and yeah i mean i guess that was the problem on screen two right the, the ending leaked and they had to change the killers it was supposed to be Derek. And then they swapped in uh, Mickey for him at the end. And, uh, you know, it's it's a real bummer that they didn't get to do their original vision because, you know, somehow it got out. But, uh, yeah, I did know about that leak and it was a real bummer. We were all just, you know, we were all just, you know, it's like, well, you know, you're ruining it for other people. Like if you if you found it somehow, OK, but you don't have to, you know, put it online. Yeah. But I guess that's some people just need the attention. Oh yeah. And I tell people that all the time. I'm like, look, here's the thing. They're like, well, no, it's, you know, the people who want to know will know. Just just don't seek it out. I'm like, you don't understand. If you're in this yeah. community at all, like you're gonna if you're gonna hear you're gonna it run across somebody. It. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna come to you, you know. And then there's all the assholes and like the you know, we had like live streams where someone would be like, The killer's freaking detective yeah. Bailey, and you're like, Oh Jesus, there's just no, you know, there's no stopping an asshole. But um, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, uh, it's a shame. But you know, hopefully it didn't, you know. I, I obviously, you know, like you said, it just kind of comes to you when you're part of the fan community. But 
I'm hoping it, it wasn't that widespread and that most people got to be surprised because that's how we intended it. You know, it seems like it got nipped enough in the bud that I didn't hear much about it afterwards, like personally from, from people. So uh, they, they handled that enough. But I, I was going to say, hopefully with everything going on now, hell, they could even pay somebody just, hey, write a fucking screen script. We're going to leak it. I yeah. think it'll take one <laughs> one leak, you know, like one right. of these scripts will get out and it'll go on Reddit and everybody will be like, no, that's for sure. That's it. That's the yeah. one. And then when the movie comes out and it's completely the opposite of that, then right. maybe nobody else will ever believe <laughs> that again. Yeah, um, no, they'll so. just say, oh, no, they knew we got the, the real one, so they changed it. Oh, yeah, they rewrote it. <laughs> yeah. Just like that. <laughs> we didn't dupe us. We duped them. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, the whole Nev Campbell situation that happened, um, was that, like, so I, I understand that, like, you know, th this was a fluent situation because it was only, like, a year between movies. So I know that you guys had to write at least one script uh, with her in it. And then there was the unfortunate situation that happened and then who knows what will happen in the future. But how, how different were the two scripts at the end of the day? And sorry that you had to write two entirely scripts. No, I mean, and luckily we had some, we had some notice. So we had time to course correct when, when the deal didn't go through, but, mm -hmm. um, the, the two scripts were not that different. Honestly, it was, um, there were a few scenes obviously that had to be totally lifted, but that gave us the real estate then to focus in on other characters and other relationships. And so, you know, we were trying to turn, uh, you know, a unfortunate situation into a positive by like, now we have a little more space and we have a little more time. We can focus on these things, but structurally the, the movie was not different. You know, it was just, you can imagine how Sydney figured into that plot that we already had. Um, so it wasn't like a house of cards situation. Um, we just kind of were like, okay, well, that's, a shame now let's get in there and do the work and like let's try to you know again use the page space to to develop these relationships or these characters a little bit more and we just kind of you know it's a like you said it's a fluid situation you never know who you're gonna have at the end of the day because of availability or whatever other issues and so it's like you got to stay on your toes and make sure you've built something that like if you can't make a deal you got to take that person out and um yeah that's that's just kind of how we look at all these things like on five we didn't know if we could get any of the legacy cast back um right. and so we're like well you know we told people we had a version of the movie where they weren't in it but we didn't <laughs> yeah no. so it was we were really like oh god you know we got to get them um but you know even in that case we could have pivoted you know there was always a way to do it um i'm just really grateful that we got them all back for five and we got to have Galen Kirby in six and um, yeah, I mean, you just never know with these things. It's a, it's a, it's a very um, crazy business. Yeah. I, and I personally, I fell in love with the core four from, uh, well, from the first one in this one, like Chad, especially for me, <laughs> I just like, I was pissed. I was like, Oh man, I just fell in love with that guy. And then he died. But yeah. then like, it comes back <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? That's a stretch, but fuck it. I'm good with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm fine. At yeah, least maybe. he's alive. Maybe Chad's immortal. We don't know. I mean, we've seen him d die twice, and he's sort of the new Dewey <laughs> in terms of right. like, how, how could he survive this? But uh, yeah, it's just we can't do it. We can't yeah, do it. Yeah. We, can't, we can't kill Mason. He's just too charming. And that's what I said. I was like, you know, and by the way, that was clever how they panned back in that scene because you hear the stabs, but you don't really yeah. see where they're going. And I like, think we had to take some arms. out actually, just to to, oh, to, really? to to up the believability. We, we they had to remove half the stabs just that because it was, too, it was like, no, there's no way he's human if he survives this. And even, yeah. even as is, it's, it's a little stretching credibility. Yeah, but bit, he sold but, it uh, so well though. I mean, he looked like he was dying. You know what I mean? Like he had yeah. blood in the mouth and everything. I, he's, a, he's a great actor and he pulled that off. And then you, but you just, yeah, you really want that, that moment at the end where it's, you know, kind of a, kind of a happy ending for the core four. Yeah. And I, I think that you guys earned that with scream five. Like I always hate, good. I hate, hate, and I always tell people this. I'm like, when people are complaining about movies and stuff, I'm like, look, Dewey's my favorite Scream character probably of all time. My, and my uh, well, it's not, yeah, between him and Stu. And I was like, I love Scream. I fucking hate it that Dewey died. Like, hate it. I was like, but I still love the movie and I understand why they did it. So I'm not going to be like, I hate that movie just because I wouldn't have made this decision. I always make the joke. I'm like, uh, wrong kid died because I'm like, should have been dead. The wrong kid died. <laughs> uh, but that being said, um, does they is is are there untouchable people? I always wonder this. Like, does the mm -hmm. studio ever be like, "Hey, you can't kill so and so because it's in a contract"? Not naming whoever is whoever, but yeah, I just imagine that there's certain people they don't want dying. Uh, I'm sure that's true, but we've never run up against it. You know, like we when Jamie and I first come up with the idea for one of these movies, we all everyone's on the table, and it, usually it's that first discussion where we're like would this feel right? Would it be right for the story? Is it just for shock value or, you know, does it have 
actual value, story value. And that's kind of how we decide. And it just, we, you know, Dewey being my favorite character in the whole franchise too, with Stu as a close second. Uh, so we're exactly in, in sync on go. that. Um, <laughs> it was really, really difficult for me to go, yeah, that's, we got to do it. But story-wise, we just did. It's like at a certain point, if you're not killing those characters that have quote unquote plot armor, then you just, you're not invested. The stakes aren't high enough. It doesn't feel real. And as Kevin Williamson told us, it's like, it's a slasher movie and people have to die. And you go back to Scream 2 and he killed Randy, you know? And it's like, you didn't want Randy to go. Randy was us. Randy was our mouthpiece, you know? He was the movie nerd. He was the guy that mm -hmm. explained the rules. And it's it was shocking that they killed him halfway through. And we're still mad at him for killing Randy because we wanted to play around <laughs> with Randy. But, you know, yeah. at the same time, it, it really put you on your toes and you're sort of leaning forward going, well, if they killed Randy, they can kill anybody. And that's when you think they did kill Dewey in two. And then you think when Gail gets shot, she might've been killed. And it's like, Jesus, they're really taking them all out. Um, so no, I, I, I think, you know, if uh, that has not happened on five and six, when we went in there and, and kind of pitched that stuff, it, there was some pushback on, on Dewey for sure. But like, I think everyone got it. Like you, you have to, for the, not just the reason of like, keeping the stakes high, but like, why the hell would Sidney Prescott ever go back to Woodsboro? And we knew we right. had to have her in the third act. And it's like, that's the only thing that would get her there mm -hmm. is if, do if, you know, her, one of her best friends is killed and she's got to go avenge the death. Um, Cause we were really stuck on getting her there and putting her in the, the, the meat of the movie. And then it was like, Oh, we got to, we were going to kill Dewey later. And we were like, no, nah, no, nah, we got to move it up a little bit. And that's got to be the low point of the movie. And the only thing that can, can bring Sydney back into the action. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like, <laughs> so I feel like far, I'm being broken up with right now, guy. I'm like, it, it sucks, but I understand. I do. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you're the killer because that cut deep. <laughs> oh, that's how we felt. I mean, and, and Jamie wrote the first pass of that scene, and he, like, I think had to take the rest of the day off. And we were reminded of, like, Ronald D. Moore had, had done interviews about because he wrote Star Trek Generations. And he killed Captain Kirk, and you know he, he had to like take a moment there and, and be like, "What the hell have I done?" You know. Yeah. And we really felt the same way. It was a rough day to write it, and then man, I, you know, I wasn't on set at all for five because it was during COVID, and there were very you know a lot of restrictions. I got to go up for a couple weeks of six, but on five, you know, I'm just watching those dailies and just going, "Oh my God, is this right? Is this correct? Did we do the right thing? Have we done something terrible?" <laughs> and I completely get all the fans that that were extremely mad at us, and I, you know, I I was mad at us too, but it was like hey, we got to do it, we have to do it, and um, hopefully, like you, most people can look at it and go, "Okay, it sucks, but I get it." Yeah. Well, in, in a weird way, and I was thinking about this when I was when I was uh, writing my questions for you. I was like, if you think about it this way, in a weird way, uh, Dewey's still protecting people because, like, yeah. the only way that everybody could have survived Scream Six and it not to be a total shit show was because Dewey died in Five. So, in a way, Dewey died so that they could live in Six and be like, no, okay, the franchise, no, they'll still kill people. It's kind of like back to yeah. the Game of Thrones thing when they killed Sean Bean, poor Sean Bean. Yeah. Um, everybody knew I was like, oh, they just killed the main character of the show, so yeah. anything could fucking go the rest of these series so you were always on edge and and yeah. dewey was that i think for the other characters so in the end it, it's dewey's doing what he does and he's protecting people now i'm getting way too like deep into it but that's the no, way i'm dealing with it all right no i think that's <laughs> <laughs> i think you're you're onto something there i think that you know dewey's sacrifice allowed them to to live on and for the franchise to live on um and then hopefully we we fooled some people at least for a moment that we got gail um, because that, that moment where she's about to stab Ghostface and he gets her in the side should feel like, oh God, are, are they, are they doing it again? Um, but we're, you know, it just didn't, that didn't feel right. There was something about the connection. I mean, obviously we didn't want to be predictable where it's like, you know, they're going to kill one of the legacy characters every movie. Um, and then it becomes its own formula and you got to kind of keep people on their toes in that way. But also just like the connection that she forms with Sam in the movie really felt special. You know, like it felt like these are two kind of outsiders, classic outsiders. And, and the movie in so many ways is about family. You know, it's kind of one family against another in terms of the of Richie's family, you know, plotting this whole revenge scheme. And we have the Carpenter sisters and then the Meek Smart and twins. And they're a found family. And Gail's kind of part of that. So it's a, a kind of a theme running through the whole movie is about family and what a family actually is. And sometimes you make your own. Sometimes it's not about 
actual, you know, blood ties. It's about, um, you know, kind of finding people along the way and going, we get each other we, and we can go through life together. So it made us happy that Gail, you know, having lost Dewey finds, you know, this connection with Sam and that Sam who desperately needs kind of a mother figure in her life because her own mother's a piece of shit um, has found that connection with, with Gail. So it just felt right. Like let's, let's end on that note. Yeah. And I, I, I felt that, that moment too. That was a really good moment in the film. And I also agree that like, if you killed Gail off, it's going to set a precedent and it's like, was yeah. it like it was standard one by one. So I totally yeah. appreciate how you guys handle it. I appreciate it. How you handle the, the Sydney thing too. Cause I've always said like, you can't kill her. Um, and you don't have to agree with this or deny <laughs> or whatever, because like, you know, you got to keep anything on the table, but like, I've always said you can't kill her and you can't have her be the killer because it just ruins her plight in the previous yeah. movies. Like, why did she go through all this just to succumb to it anyways? But like when she says the line, she deserves her happy ending. I was like, fuck. Yeah. yeah. I was like, that's yeah. exactly what I've always said to people who are like, Oh, she needs to die or become the killer at some point. It's like, no, she deserves to like, <laughs> not that I don't want her in the film, but if she's not, I feel like that was handled really well, you know? Oh, thank you. I mean, I'm glad. And that, that did feel right to us too, is like we saw in five that she's not running anymore, you know, and she's not a victim anymore. She's, you know, very proactive in five. She's coming to kill somebody. Uh, mm -hmm. The killer isn't after her. She's coming. I mean, obviously it, it, Richie and, and Amber did want her there to die in that kitchen. Um, but it's like, you know, there was manipulation more than like, I, we're going after you and we're trying to, you know, kill you the whole movie. Um, we just, we liked the idea that she settled down with Kincaid from Scream 3. She's got kids. She's got a, a, a safe, nice life uh, wherever wherever it is that she lives. I think in our minds it was Seattle. But, uh, you know, I, it just, I don't see a version where she's the killer. I There might be some future story out there from somebody else that can make sense of how she could die. I You know, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I would love to see Sydney Prescott on the screen again, and and I hope that that happens someday. Um, just as a fan, you know, it's like she's a, an important character. I just hope it makes sense, you know. Like you said, I don't. I, I hope it's not just like to have her, you know. If if it makes sense for a story, then great. Right. Yeah. And she, I mean, she technically, she had a really nice send off in three too, like where she leaves the yeah. door open, you know, and then Mark's like, Hey, we're going to watch a movie, you know, it's yeah. just with McDreamy, you know, whatever. Just watch <laughs> a blockbuster. I'm like, Hey, good for her. You know, I'm don't get me wrong. I'm always happy to see Sydney Prescott, but like at some point, you know, like I know that you, I think you said at one point that you had a list of characters when you guys were writing these movies of people you'd like to maybe bring back in the fold. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's certain ties in there's, there's, uh, Kyle Gallner, who's awesome, uh, and scream. He's, uh, what, uh, Stu's nephew, nephew. Yeah. Yeah. He's his nephew. And there's all these family ties and things like that. I have heard from people that you are the, of the group. You're the Stu dude. Like you're the <laughs> one that's, that's like, and around here, that's like a religion to us. I mean, we got t-shirts yeah. and everything. Like we're fucking... <laughs> You guys, I got notes. You guys can have them. You can read them and you can laugh at me um, if you want to. <laughs> like, I, I would, I'm a huge stew guy. So obviously you can't say, you know, and if you tell me that he's dead, I just won't believe you. So there's really nothing that you can <laughs> say. Uh, but I do wonder, like, what are those conversations like when you guys sit down? Have you guys like discussed that? And is it like, are there people who are like, no fucking way? And other people are like, maybe. And then what's that like with you guys? I mean, we did. You're right that we did have a list of characters we'd love to bring back into the into the franchise, and like Kirby was top of the list. Um, and so it wasn't just the fans online that were, you know, saying we want Kirby back. We wanted Kirby back. We we think Hayden's a great actor, and we love the character of Kirby. And we wanted to put her in five, and there just wasn't enough room. You know, it was like we already were juggling three groups of characters, and it was uh, it was just too overstuffed as it was. Um, so. But yeah, I mean, like we, we've talked about everybody, of course. And it's like, then there's certain things that, that feel right and certain things that don't feel right. And it's got to make sense for the story. Um, mm. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, I got to meet Matthew Lillard at a screening of five and he was sitting right in the row behind me and my wife. And so we got to hear his reactions in real time to, you know, things that were happening in the movie. And it was just a delight because Stu, like I said, is, is right, really, really close to favorite character, you know, just... Um, I just love his performance in the original and I just love him as an actor. And we, I think we scared him a little bit, my wife and I, cause we're such mega fans of him as an actor. We were quoting lines to him from his TV show that he was on called the bridge. And mm -hmm. he was like, wow, you guys really are. Fans. <laughs> I think he was a little bit like, oh, I love seeing everything, speed, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I can't obviously say anything about Stu and you know, I'm not, I'm not going to fall into that trap, but I love Matthew <laughs> Lillard. I love the character and, you know, 
Uh, and, and to be honest, we've talked about everybody and it just has to make sense for the story. Yeah. Well, I'm just happy that we've got one of our own on the inside. That's that's all I'm taking <laughs> away from that. I feel like uh, the whole thing's been done well. Like not only was the first one, you guys have so much on your plate. Like I really do look at it because I've, I've sat back and like, how would I even do that and bring Stu back in and all this? And I'm like, aside from that, there's just so much on your, your plate from the Sydney Prescott stuff to the legacy characters, to the new people, to uh, being the first people to make a movie after Wes um, and just the entire thing. I, I admire what you guys have done. And I think that I speak for all Scream fans, at least the most of them for, you know, when I say thank you guys, you guys have done a hell of a job with that's not just your standard slasher sequel stuff. You guys have a lot to live up with and you're bringing it into the future in a little bit. And I really hope that we get to see the same team do seven, eight, nine, 32 and 47. You know, I'd be good with that for sure. <laughs> well, thanks. That really means a lot uh, coming from a true fan. You know, that those are the people that we want to make happy. You know, that, that was the bar, you know, and it's like box office is great and, and, and critics are, you know, what they are. And it was just like, can we do right by the fans? Because first and foremost, we are fans. And so if we can make ourselves happy and just go, well, that that feels like a good screen movie, then we've done our job. And we just want to make the fans, the new fans and the, the loyal fans from the beginning, just, you know, feel like you got a screen movie um, and hope, that hopefully you enjoy. Yep, that's what it felt like, man. Hey, thank you once again. We're out of time, but anytime you want to come back on show, I could talk to you about Scream all day long. And <laughs> no, we'll see if our again. shirts match again next time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <It's so bizarre>. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, man. I really appreciate your time. I hope you have you a great can. day. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me.